Dear kind and gracious Father in heaven, we come before you this Sabbath morning giving you thanks and praise, Lord, for being our God, for letting us know that you have words for us, words of encouragement, words of peace, words of direction, Father, promises that you fulfill. And Lord, we ask your presence to be upon us this morning as we present your message. Let our hearts and minds be open to hear and guide us and lead us with the power of your spirit to serve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, kind of we'll start off with a story. Is that okay? Kind of a true story. Kind of happened many moons ago. And as I'm doing that, can I have a couple of the deacons come forward for me for a minute? I need some help. I will grab any deacon or anyone. Yeah, I'm getting all kinds of help. That's awesome. <laughs> So kind of getting back to the story, many moons ago, true story, happened like this. At one point in time, I was in the United States Air Force. And when I was in the Air Force, we have this thing called basic training, All right? Basic training, and you might say, basic training, what is that? Well, let me put it this way, it's not so basic in the sense of, yeah, you're learning all kind of new things as far as military life, but it's also a time when they try to break you to see if you are good enough to be a part of the United States military. And so, of course, that not only means book work, but that means doing all kind of grueling physical activities and on top of that, having to keep your barracks and your place where you slept and your locker clean. And you had to fold your underwear a certain way. So we had a lot of our other airmen starching underwear to make sure that they lined up, right? Now, of course, I didn't do that because I don't like that. But we had that happening. And so during the military time, right, this basic training where you're running and stuff like that, they're trying to break you down. It's a grueling time, you're thinking, why did I make this choice, kind of a thing. And then you start saying, Lord, did you want me to come here? And it's like, uh, so you're all over the place. And then a couple of weeks in to the training process to make it even better, I'm sitting there and of course, at that particular time, we didn't have the cool thing that we have now today which is the internet. And we didn't have these things. Cell phones where you can text and Facebook and all that other kind of stuff. So what we had at that time was what we called snail mail. And of course we had to wait for letters to come, right? And so of course, you know, you're hoping that grandma would send their favorite packages of goodies, right? Cakes, cookies, and things like that um, and stuff. Well, at that particular time, two weeks into it, I got a letter. And it's what we call a Dear John letter. And if you're not sure what a Dear John letter is, let me put it this way. When I went into the service, right, right, I was, uh, out of high school, went into college a little bit at U of M, decided to go into the military a little bit. And of course, you have a girlfriend, high school sweetheart saying, oh, this must be it, right? And one of the things is kind of a, a preface, though, is, is that I think God told me something in a dream, but I didn't listen, right? But anyway, so girlfriend thinking everything's cool, dear John Letter, right? But it didn't start off that way. 
I got the letter. I'm sitting there, oh, this is so exciting, you know. How's it going in basic training? Are you doing okay? How's things happening? You're like, oh, yeah, you know, stay encouraged, blah, blah, blah. You know, how's the family? My family's doing fine. You're like, oh, this is so great. And then it comes to the end of the letter. It says, hey, by the way, I'm breaking up with you. <laughs> and of course, I was devastated, right? And of course you got, because we were in the squadron I was in, it was all men. And so you're sitting there and you're trying to hold your face together. And of course, you know, you're hurting and, and they're like, what's going on? What did, what's going on in the letter? What's happening? You're like, everything's good, right? It's just fine, right? And so I'm crying and dying inside, of course. And I was saying, how can I deal with this kind of a thing, right? So I'm dealing with hurt. I'm dealing with sadness. And at the same time, I have to keep myself together because we have to run. We have to do cleaning. We have to do all kind of stuff in the military to keep you going. So, it's to the point where I'd be doing my drills during the day, getting back, and when they say lights out, right, I'd get into my bunk, right, and you have guys all up and down the bunk, a bay of 20 guys where I was at in the squadron. And I'd be sitting there in the bed crying, <laughs> right? You know, how could you do this to me? God, how could you do this to me? All this kind of stuff going on and things of that nature. So one evening after the lights were out, I snuck out of the bed, right? And of course, the only place you can sneak to in the squadron bay is the bathroom, the latrine, or the head, as we call it, right? So I went in there and took my Bible because I was like, what can I do? I, I'm just hurting about this whole thing. So I kind of had the Bible there as I was sitting. and. You know how you kind of just open it, right? And so the Bible that evening opened to this passage of Scripture. It said this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. After I read that passage of scripture, I mean, if you think about it, Premier, most of us have memorized that, but just reading it. I started to feel a sense of peace and hope coming back. Yes, yeah, I was still hurt, right? Stuff like that doesn't go away. But I knew that God was still with me. that he was there comforting me, that he was there helping to restore me, and reminding me that no matter what I face in life, he always has something better in store for me. So, was it that you are facing today? What is it that you're facing or in need of today? Is it forgiveness, healing, restoration, protection, dealing with fear, temptation, reassurance, 
What is it? Do you feel confused, unsure, hurt? Are you angry? Are you scared? Do you feel anxious? Do you have this sense of hopelessness or helplessness floating around? Or do you feel alone? Or do you think that no one cares? Do you feel that sometimes that even praying doesn't give you any momentum or motivation. Well, when these moments seem to come up, when you seem to face them, whether it be for you or for me, it's sometimes good to remember to go back to what I call the basics. Go back to the basics. It's time to kind of go back and remember God's promises in his word. Remembering promises that you found throughout your life that are very helpful, very restoring, very encouraging. Now, everybody's heard the word promises before, right? And everybody has a definition of promise, correct? All right, well, let me give you an interesting <coughs> definition of promise here. Basically, when we talk about promises here, we're talking about uh, statements that we tell other people um, of some kind of intent that we're going to do or something that is going to happen sometime in the future. Right? Is that about right when we talk about promises? When we make promises, I promise to, I promise to, right? Either we're going to do something, some intent, or we're going to do it sometime in the future. So if we think about promises and think about the Bible, and kind of using this to help us in these different times or to give us support. So I did a little checking and stuff like that. And what I found was this. Did you know that in the Bible, somebody went and tried counting these things, right? And in God's inspired, God-breathed word, as I call it, there's over 3,500 promises to help us with whatever we're facing. 3,500, and actually some say 5,000. It could be countless, right? It just depends on how you look at it. Right? So 3,500, 5,000 could be countless, and things of that nature. And if we were to think about the New Testament and the Greek, it seems that this word promise kind of appears maybe about 51 times, or actually 13 times, and the Greek word is what we call epigalalia, right? Epigalalia, promise. But usually when we talk about it in the New Testament, it is considered like a legal term, right? And it's associated with an appropriate promise, so a legal appropriate promise, meaning, hey, there's something that is binding by it, and it's going to happen, right? So that's the New Testament. But if you think about the other part of the Bible, right, which would be the Old Testament, right? There's actually no specific Hebrew word for promise, right? Even though you see the translations, right, in there that may say promise, a lot of times what that translated word in Hebrew, which is the bar, or the basic verb to speak, and so when we talk about promises in the Old Testament, it's about a speaking of something to take place. Right? So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Joshua. It's scripture reading this morning. So turn to Joshua 23. Joshua 23, and we're going to be going to Verse 14. Not yet. Thank you, sir. I've got the time. 
Joshua 23, when you're there, say amen. amen. All right. So as we're looking at this specific passage of Scripture, we want to kind of look at this in the context of what has happened up until this point. It's been about 27 to 30 years since Moses had passed away, and the torch of leading the children of Israel into the promised land was passed on to Joshua. And of course, Joshua went in, and he did conquer and provide the promised land as God promised to the people of Israel. So he met many battles. We, you can look from chapter 1 on, where it's, uh, God talked about being strong and courageous, encouraging Joshua from the beginning as he took leadership, moving on to um, other areas where we talk about the Battle of Jericho, and then we move on to other kingdoms, and, and even in one of the chapters, it lists a lot of the kings that were defeated, and he even talks about the day that in the battle, Joshua prayed, and as he prayed to the Lord, holding the sun and the moon still so that their enemies could not escape. Right? All of these things have been taking place, and now Joshua, around maybe 110 or so, is now addressing the children of, or actually the leaders of Israel in his farewell address, right? And so, if we were to look at this and what has gone on during that time frame, right? We're gonna be looking at verse 14, but before we read that specific passage, each of you have been provided Nice little handout, is that right? Right. Now I'm going to tell you what to do with it a little bit here in a moment. But if you look at that piece of handout, right, it has some common themes that we seem to kind of face, right, that we feel that we may need encouragement or some other things in our lives. And, of course, you notice there are no scriptures there. And that was done on purpose. And on the back, you're going to find that it should say promise and nothing there, correct? Because you may say, you know, you know, Harvey may not have it all together, right? And you might want to come up with your own stuff, right? So we'll tell you more about that here, what to do shortly. So what I want to do is as we go back to Joshua, we want to talk about the first promise that I want you to think about. Oh, I already read Psalms 23. Oh, okay. So we'll go to the first promise here in Joshua. And we're going to read this here. Starting with verse 10. Now I am about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. And promises means what God has spoken has failed. But it also says every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. So think about this. God keeps his promises is the first promise. Sometimes take a look back on your life and reflect just as Joshua did as he spoke to the leaders of Israel in his farewell address. Take a look at what's happened in your life. Yes, there should be ups and downs. You should have went left instead of right. All of those things. But what has God promised to you? And how has he fulfilled them to you? Sometimes it's hard to see. But if you are still alive and here breathing today, is that not one of his promises? So for Joshua, he looked back and reminded them what God has spoken has come to be. His promise is fulfilled. And so we must think about that. Now, as we go from there, from Joshua, we're going to just jump around to a couple of promises that we want to take a moment to look at for a minute. 
So we're going to go on to this next one here. How many of us like to do this worry stuff? Worry, being anxious. You know, as a psychologist, you know we actually have a mental disorder that says excessive worrying, right? We call it, uh, it's kind of more pathological, right? Because you're worrying about everything. You know, worrying about, uh, you know, can I pay my bills? I mean, that's an okay thing, but it's not stopping there. It's like, oh, I'm going to worry about what they think about me. Oh, I'm going to worry about, you know, will a car start today? Oh, I got to worry about this. You're worrying about everything, right? Feeling anxious about all kind of stuff, right? So there is a Bible promise for that. So why don't you take your Bibles for a moment? And let's go to the most famous one here, Matthew chapter 6, right? Matthew 6. Just for a moment. Matthew chapter 6. And starting at verse 5, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Jesus actually started off as he was teaching um, in conjunction with the Beatitudes there. He was talking about, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and clothing? And he goes on, right? But then he points out something that I think we forget sometimes. If you look at verse 26, he says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Think about what happens out there in nature. And if you think about some of the smallest birds, even that little hummingbird, that little cute little guy flipping around, God takes care of them. He feeds them. And then he says something to this effect, are you not much more valuable than they are? God's promise. Yes, you know, we worry about things, but God says, hey, I take care of everything. I think sometimes we forget that because we're so focused on what we're worried about, we forget this promise. We forget this promise sometimes, right? You can look at some of the other ones as you look them up, but there's also something about cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Um, and this beautiful one here in Jeremiah 29, right? He talks about, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, right? Plans for you to fail? Does he say plans for you to fail? What does he say? Plans for you to what? To prosper, to not harm you. About hope. Right? So, if you kind of picked up what we're going to be doing, or what you will be doing, is that when you get a chance, you guys are going to come up with your own Bible promises and write them down for you. And you're going to keep that stuff around with you all the time. So that way, if you forget or whatever, or you're worried about things, you can pull these things out and remember those scriptures and cite them to yourself to kind of help encourage you in those times when you're facing whatever it is that you're coming across. Right? So let's go on to the next one. How about this? Supplying all your needs. How many of us need things? Amen? Right? We need all kind of stuff, right? Money, other things, right? All that stuff, right? But why don't you turn to Romans 8 real quick. Romans, Romans 8, chapter 30, or I'm sorry, Romans 8, verse 32, just for a second. Let's look at that promise here for just a minute. Romans 8, 32. One of these promises here with that. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Think about that. The God of the universe gave us his only son. 
gave us his only son to redeem us, to restore us to him. If he's willing to do that, what more will he do for us? Right? The needs that we have, the, the things that are important to us. Can we trust him? Do we allow ourselves to trust him enough to provide? So keep that in mind. And then you can look at some of the other ones. He will meet your needs according to his gracious riches in Christ. Even in Philippians, you know, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. So things to kind of keep in mind about this promise here. Let's move on to this one. How many of us face temptation? Everybody should be saying, yeah, amen, because it's a daily thing. It can be, right? All kind of stuff, right? But let's take a look here at 1 Corinthians for a minute. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Let me turn there for a moment. Let's look at this promise. He said this, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. But he also said this, and God is faithful. He will not let you be, temp be tempted beyond what you can bear. He doesn't throw us under the bus, right? But he can strengthen us and get us through. But he says this, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way for you to stand up under whatever it is that you're facing. Do we forget that sometimes? Sometimes it's easier to give in and say, Lord, please forgive me later. But he can give you the strength to stand up to that temptation. Right? And then think about Jesus himself, right? We can look at the Gospels there. Was Jesus also tempted? The Bible says he was tempted just like we were, right? And he was able to overcome. And because of what he did, we can gather strength knowing that if Jesus can resist, can he give us the power to resist as well? Yes, he can. It's just we have to remember those kind of promises. Let's move on. Promises for forgiveness. Some of us, yes, we are tempted and some of us give in. Is that right? We fail. And some of us, depending on what it is, can beat us up, beat ourselves up to the point of we can't see the light of day. But we have a couple of, of promises here that helps us with that. If you're not familiar with this passage of scripture, you should be Ezekiel 36, and you can look at it for yourself. He says something about, I will give you a new heart, right? Even though we fail, even though we give in, we are, can be forgiven, but he will give us a new heart and put a right spirit within us. Is that correct? But one of the other things, you know how sometimes we can be stubborn? How many of us have been told that we've been stubborn? How many of us would admit that we're stubborn? Right? Well, sometimes that stubbornness comes because we harden ourselves certain things instead of being open and flexible to understand or to see well guess what not only can he does he forgive us but he can renew a new heart and he can take that heart that we've kind of made harder than a rock he can make it to a heart of flesh meaning a heart open for christ to come in to help us to strengthen us to remember who he is to gather strength Isn't this fun stuff? Isn't this exciting stuff? Right? All right, let's go on for this. Healing. How many of us are dealing with health issues? Or it doesn't have to be a physical health issue. What about spiritual hurt or all of those other things that we face? All right? Sometimes this can be the toughest one, right? Because sometimes if you're dealing with a physical hurt, whatever it may be, it really hurts depending on the pain. 
correct? And sometimes you're focused so much on the pain, it's hard to see other things. It's hard to remember promises. It's hard to, to, to focus on Christ and, and these things. But he says something like this. If you think about Jeremiah chapter 30, all right? Jeremiah chapter 30. He says something like this. I will restore your health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. I will restore you. He says that. Sometimes it's hard for us to see it. Sometimes we might want it now. And I wish I could say sometimes for some of us that we would get it, but sometimes some of us don't. Does that mean that God has failed in his promises? No. For some of us, even in the hurt, we sometimes will fall asleep. But God is faithful to his promise that he will restore. Even if that means that restoration comes when Christ comes back, where we don't have to deal with it anymore, because now it's eradicated forever. Right? But he also says this, praise the Lord. If you look at Psalms 103, oh, my soul, forget all, not his benefits, who provides forgiveness and heals us from all of our diseases. Again, a cool promise to latch on to when we're struggling with this stuff. And it can be spiritual health and things. Maybe you're saying, I need more strengthening spiritually. Well, this all applies to that. Yes, it doesn't always have to be a physical. It also can be spiritual in the struggle that we face. Right? So let's look at another promise. Let's look at how to deal with fear. How many of us are scared of some things? Well, let me put it this way. If you've been looking out in the world today, right, is it getting kind of scary out there? It's scary. Some crazy stuff is happening out there, all part of what's been prophesied, but it's still scary, right, when you look at it. But, this here, Psalms 34, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. And even in John, a peace I leave you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Even Jesus' own words talks about, do not give into the fear. But if you think about this, if you think about even stories of the Bible that can be used as promises. When Jesus was with his disciples, right? And this, they were on the sea and all of this torment came about and the waves were all over and they thought they were going to die because it was just crazy. Jesus was on the back of the boat sleeping peacefully as this was going on, the disciples was running around. And they woke him up, hey, master, help us. We're going to perish if you don't do anything about this. And then what did Jesus do? He stood up. He said, raised his hands and said, peace. Be still. And what happened? The, the torment was gone. Sometimes remembering stories like that as a promise that whatever storm is raging in your life, Allow Jesus to be a part of being, saying, peace, be still, and see what happens. See what happens. Then we have to talk about protection. Is that right? Travel. Um, we travel. We do all kind of stuff. Protection becomes very important. And, of course, there are all kind of passages for protection and things. And, of course, this one here. In Psalms 91, one of my favorite uh, psalms there, where he also talks about he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings will you find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and ramp. Think about it. Did he not promise us and give us guardian angels to watch over us? Does he not look out for us? 
And just think about this, right? How many of us have been delayed traveling once in a while? Been delayed, and then all of a sudden, you, you know, you're kind of upset because you're delayed, you're running late, and as you're going, you see this massive accident or some kind of bad thing that's happened, right? Would that be, I take it as God looking out for me. Because if I would have been there sooner, maybe I would have been a part of that. So, promises for deliverance, right? How about facing death and grief? Do we face that? Do we have family members and friends that we love that face this? Things that come up unexpected and stuff like that? But if you haven't read this, well, we are, well depending on who you are, most of us have read the story of Lazarus. Most of us remember the story of Lazarus, but sometimes it's good to go back and read Lazarus in John chapter 11, right? Jesus loved him very much, of course. He passes away, right? He passes away. They finally get Jesus to, to come, and of course, he's pretty hurt by seeing his friend and Jesus Christ himself, right? So not only when we face death, and grief, he cries with us. But think about what else happened, right? Jesus said, remove the stone, and then what? He said, Lazarus, come forth. And what happened? Did Lazarus stay in there? Did Lazarus not come out alive and restored? Yes. Demonstrating that he has the power over life and death. And there's something in Revelation, right? Revelation chapter 21. A promise that is to come. He says something like this. After the new Jerusalem has come down, after Christ has come back, and he recreates a new heaven and a new earth, he says something about he will wipe every tear. Right? Every tear from their eyes, there will be no more death. There will be no more mourning, crying, or pain, for the order of things of old have passed away. God has been faithful in the past. He's faithful now. He's faithful in the future. All that we see today and face with grief and death will be no more. For some of us, this is hard because it's like there was one, yeah, it will be no more. All right, what about wisdom? How many of us would like that stuff? Making good choices, those kind of things. Well, there's promises for that. And of course, the good one, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, when he talks about trusting the Lord with all your heart, lean not unto your own understanding, Think about it, when we kind of do our own thing, we kind of get messed up, right? I'll admit it, yeah, I lean, instead of waiting on the Lord, it's like I do my own thing and then I'm in trouble, right? But if we acknowledge him, he will guide our path. He will make them straight, he will give us direction. That means, yes, we have to let go, right? And also in James, anybody who lacks wisdom, ask God, who gives. If you want it, ask him, right? How hard is that? But sometimes we have this thing called pride that gets in the way, is that right? Yeah. And let's look at one last one area here. How many of us, children, right? How many of us want our children to be saved, to be able to, when Jesus comes back, we all are together. And even for some of us, we think, will that ever happen because of the choices they make, or where they're at right now, right? Well, that's a sign of good parenting, right? Because you care, right? You love your kids, we love our kids, 
But there's promises for that. He talks about uh, in Isaiah, I will contend with those who contend with you and your children, I will say. Right? You just have to trust him on that. And we talk about the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. He is patient with us. And if you think about this, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish. If we go back and look at 2 Peter, that passage of scripture, does he want everybody to... He doesn't want anybody to lose out on the gift of eternal life, the gift of his son. He doesn't want that. And he does whatever he can to make this happen as much as he can, right? For everyone to come. Now, of course, we still have to make choices. But the thing is, he works overtime to try to fulfill that promise, and he does. But sometimes we have to remember that. Sometimes we have to remember that. So, if you have that sheet of paper, I encourage you, when you have a moment, take some time to write down one or two passages of Scripture that, for you, in those areas or other areas that you want to have, write those down for yourself. Go back, look them up, right? If you can, take your Bibles, mark them up, right? It's okay to highlight and mark marks in here. Helps you to remember where to find stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But give it a special color to say my promises or something to that effect, but write them down. And then with that piece of paper, keep it with you. So that way, if the things come up, you can go to it. You can pull it up and say, I'm facing this. What did I have written down? And remember what it is and kind of cite it. And if you have a harder time, you heard of what we call posty notes? You heard of post-its? You know, those sticky things? It's okay to write the verse down or write it down and post it somewhere, right, in a mirror. You can post all kind of stuff in the mirror because eventually we got to go to the mirror, right? You know, because we like to get ready for things, right? Mm -hmm. Well, right there in the mirror, you can see it, right? But post that around. Post it around to remember those promises. To help guard you, to help strengthen you, and things. And as we close this morning, I want you to think about John chapter 17. John chapter 17. It was in this passage of scripture when Jesus was in the garden just before his crucifixion. And he did three things there. Because this is, a, for him, it was a scary time, if you think about it. He knew what was going to happen, but it's still scary, still hurtful, that kind of stuff. And he did three things. He did... He prayed for himself to encourage him to be able to glorify his father. Then he prayed for his disciples to give them the power of the spirit to be able to, to spread the, the word. But he also had a third part of his prayer. He prayed for each and every one of us. Pray for each and every one of us. And I truly believe that he had our faces in his mind when he prayed. That he thought about me, you, 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 right there. Right there in the garden. Each and every one of us. Praying for us. To encourage us, for us to come to know him, to accept be a part of receiving his gift of salvation. And then, of course, after that, he was arrested, tried, and crucified. But it doesn't stop there. Because on the third day, he was resurrected. And now he intercedes on our behalf in the most holy place. So, take advantage of God's word, the promises that he's given to us, thousands of them in there, the 
find those that will help you. Back to the basics. Back to the basics. Remember his promises. Hold on to them. Hold on. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much for your word and for the promises that you have given to us and fulfilled. And I ask, Lord, no matter what we face, no matter where we are, not only our praises and things, Lord, but help us to hold on to your promises. Let them encourage us. Let them give us strength. Oh, Lord, we ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Closing.